Hey everyone, it's Q&A Tuesday. Guys, today we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, if you remember a while back on one of the Q&As, uh, someone asked me a question in regards to what I think about Archie Luxury Watch Channel. Next question comes from Goat Cheddar. <laughs> what is your opinion of Archie Luxury and his, his influence on the wa in the watch world? Uh, well, I went out and I watched a few videos about Archie Luxury. Um, I got to be honest with you, I like the guy. So Paul, if you're watching this, hit me up. Let's do a collab together. I would love to get your opinion on a few things and certainly would love to answer some of your questions, which I'm sure you have for a guy like me. So what I did is I reached out to Archie Luxury. Now, I would have loved to have gone and visit him, but the guy's in Australia, so it's a bit of a hike for me. So I reached out to him via email. I said, hey, Archie, would you like to do a collab together? Standard Q&A format, you can ask away, ask me anything, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Lo and behold, Archie replied a day later. It was a 14 hour time difference between us in Australia now. Uh, and I said, yeah, I'd love to do a collab. And he actually did a little uh, video on his channel sort of introducing what we're going to do and then sent me a bunch of questions. So I'm gonna go in and uh, start answering those questions. Hey guys, Archie Luxury, Archie Luxury channel. And today guys, I'm gonna be doing some questions, Q&A, with Roman Scarf. So I got a few questions. What do you think? I'm Archie Luxury. I'm the one who invented the term shitter watch. What do you think of the term shitter, shitter, shitter watches? And as Archie said, it's gotta fucking hurt. It's gotta cost as much so your wife or girlfriend would go, that's so funny. <laughs> what do I think of the term shitter watch that Archie Luxury patented, I guess. This is his term. And then uh, when he refers to shitter watch, and I'm trying to get his, his accent as best as possible here, shitter watch is something that's under $2,000, doesn't have a whole lot of resale value or sometimes horological value. Well, first and foremost, Archie, I got to tell you, I tell my clients, my customers, my friends, and anybody out there that's watching that, you know, watches are not an investment. You should buy what you like first and foremost. So if somebody is out there and you can, they can only afford a watch that's under 2000 that may not have much resale value, that may not have uh, a whole lot of horological value, it's basically not getting a perpetual calendar under $2,000 for any brand for that matter, unless you're buying a quartz watch. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think people should buy what they like first and foremost in the price range that they can afford. And I can think of a bunch of quote unquote shitter watches out there that would actually be a good value. Again, not a whole lot going on horologically, but value wise, there's quite a few watches out there you can pick up. Good old Rolex Datejust. That was the first fancy watch I've ever bought myself. I spent $1,000 on a 19 something or other uh, beat up Rolex Datejust on a Jubilee bracelet where the band was like a rainbow. But nevertheless, it was probably the hottest thing for me at the time. And I used to walk around doing this all the time so people would actually see that I have a Rolex. And that would be considered, quote unquote, a shitter watch. A lot of IWC older aqua timers are out there for under $2,000. A lot of Omegas, you can pick up brand new Omegas today for under $2,000. And those would fall into that category of a shitter watch. Watch. But nevertheless, uh, there are quite a few watches out there around that $2,000 mark or under that are indeed shitter watches. And this is from those C brands that you never ever heard of. Guys just go out there, buy Chinese movies, manufacture stuff, put a little bit of gold in it, dress it up, market it crazy, and try to charge $2,000 for it. So it would be probably those that have no resale value after the fact that I would consider to be quote unquote shitter watches as you call them. Those like cheaper Rolexes, IWCs, and some of the older Jaegers and so on and so forth, those to me would still be considered good watches even though they're under $2,000. Hope that makes sense. Next question. I want to ask you this, Robert. I've noticed with a lot of YouTube uh, watch channels there, it's a very competitive market. And uh, I got to tell you something. One of the nastiest things that's happened in recent times, people are buying subscription they're buying subscribers they're buying views tell me what you think of that that's a great question i actually to be honest with you was not aware that you could buy followers and viewers or views 
for your YouTube channel. I was aware that you can do that on Instagram, you can do that via Facebook just by paying Facebook. And uh, Instagram has a bunch of these apps where you can go from you know 100 followers to 100,000 followers. And I've seen some of my colleagues actually do that. I found that to be just dumb. Uh, you know, and you know, it's a good old saying, and it's not mine. You know, being famous on Instagram is like being rich in Monopoly. I have about uh, 40,000 followers, 42,000 followers on my uh, Instagram account, and uh, every one of those followers I got organically by either people giving me shout outs or hashtagging properly, so on and so forth. Instagram or YouTube is not something I did uh, in order to gain uh, popularity, in order to gain more followers and feel better about myself. I could care less about that, I'll be honest with you. In fact, I'm more concentrated on YouTube now because I feel like whatever it is I do on YouTube, it sort of stays, and it stays for years. People can always go back and refer some of my older videos. I get new clients and new viewers every single day. Uh, but paying for viewers uh, on YouTube or paying for subscribers on YouTube is the dumbest thing you can do. Why would I want you know, 50,000 bots clicking on my thing, you know, adding the likes, adding the views? I'm not doing this to make money. Uh, perhaps those that do open up YouTube channels to generate an income because you can monetize your videos, perhaps that works for them. But I'm fairly certain that YouTube is not stupid and all those fake clicks and followers sooner or later get turned off and you risk of losing your YouTube channel. So overall, I think whoever is doing that is just, you're just lying to yourself. I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! It's the dumbest thing you can do. Next question, next question, next question. I gotta tell you this now. I'm a huge, 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 huge Patek Philippe fan. I love my Patek Philippe. And uh, I wanted to ask you, I recently had some, some troubles with a Patek Philippe box. What do you think of these Patek boxes where the interior, the interior gets that sticky, awful interior? What do you think of that? And what can I do about it? Well, first I'm gonna tell you, I don't share your excitement in regards to Patek Philippe overall, even though it's known as the Rolls Royce of all watches. I am not a big Patek Philippe fan. My favorite brand, as I'm sure you know, is Audemars Piguet. Nevertheless, I don't knock Patek Philippe. They do make some great timepieces, some great complications. And indeed, I do believe that Patek Philippe is the Rolls Royce of all watches. But how are you, the Rolls Royce of all watches out there, by making such crappy boxes as you mentioned? And guess what? I went down to my storage room and I actually found an old Patek Philippe box, similar to the one you show, except this is probably for a college travel on a strap. And let's see what this sucker looks like. Not only does it get all sticky and mushy inside, it starts to flake. It starts to crack, it starts to flake. The inner part is probably the worst thing ever. Uh, this is not leather, this is like leather or fake leather. I don't even know what this stuff is. And it flakes over time. Uh, it does get sticky on the inside, whether it's from humidity. And the padding, like this thing is actually soft inside. Eventually it starts to deflate and gets hard on you. And then the box completely falls apart. So shame on you, Patek Philippe, for making boxes like this. You're gonna be selling a 20, 30, $40,000 watch. You're gonna be the Rolls Royce of all watches. Oh, look, this thing is like flaking on me as we speak. I don't know if you guys see the stuff falling down, but uh, this is the end result when I ran my fingers through that fleather, as I called it. The best way to answer that is to use your terminology. This is a shitter box. Uh, and it definitely does not go in line with the watches that they produce and the image that they have. Personally, I think Patek Philippe should give the option of previous owner of some of the older pieces that have some of the older boxes to actually return them and be replaced by the newer boxes that they made. So throw that one out comes the new box. Now, they did a much better job on the newer boxes, and I think the reason for that is because the stuff inside is actually real leather this time. They spent a little bit more money on making these boxes. It's still nice and soft. Uh, there's no flaking. This box is, I don't know how long I've had this box in the office, but it's one of, it was an extra shelf, so I must have had it for a while. But nicely executed leather. It's glued better. They're using a different glue in order to glue this leather together. None of this stuff will ever flake or rip on you. I mean, I can do this all day long and this box will stay intact. So in the very least, they did fix the issue with their boxes. I'm sure they were fully aware of it. But nevertheless, shame on you for some of the older boxes. And I think you should give your clients the opportunity to get out there and have them replaced for free. In fact, Archie, what I think you should do is contact Patek Philippe. Uh, send them an email, send them some pictures of your old boxes. Hey guys, I have an expensive uh, world time. I believe you have a world time paddock. 
And this is the box that I have for it. Can I get a new box? This is so bad, it's embarrassing. And maybe they'll give you a new one. I wanna ask you something. What do you think of Pam? Pam used to be so cool. Pam was such a cool, cool, cool brand. Do you think it's possible that Pam will come back from the living dead? Well, I talked about Panera in a couple of my other episodes, and uh, to answer your question is, yes, they will. This company is not going anywhere. They're part of the Richmond Group, which will put money into enough advertising and marketing to revive the brand. But there's one more very, very important thing they need to do. Pam came out around the time where the market on watches was hot overall, pre that 2007 financial crisis. And what they did is they jumped on the bandwagon of limited editions. And by limited editions, I mean every single watch they made was a limited edition. They had regular limited editions, which were limited to 500 to 1,000, and they had the limited limited editions they used to sell over a list, the ones they made 100 of, or they were made specifically for something. Why were they so hot when they came out? Because they were different. There was nothing out there like that. It was also around the time where bulky watches were coming into the market as becoming more and more popular. This is when the offshores were taking off. This is when a lot of the bulkier stuff was doing well, the big brightlings, etc. And all of a sudden, you had a bunch of Panaristis out there. Even the website popped up, panaristi.com, for all those Panerai lovers. I remember those things flying off the shelves. People would call me and they would wait and say, I don't care, I'll pay two, three, four thousand dollars over a list. I want this Panerai in my collection, blah, 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 blah. And then what happened? Poof, they left. And the reason they left the market and the reason they got cold is because they did not reinvent themselves. They've only been around for a short amount of time. So by continuing making the same thing over and over and over and over, they lose. The limited edition stuff lost its appeal. Uh, the overall look lost its appeal. You got the Marina, you got the 1950 case, you got the radio mirror, blah, 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 and that's it. And they keep dressing them up differently, making limited editions. After a while, that will lose its appeal. So what Panerai needs to do is they need to regroup, they need to cut their production drastically once again, they need to come out with something new, something fresh, that will once again light up that spark in that quote-unquote Panaristis, as well as other watch collectors. We're probably another good five years away from Panerai reinventing themselves, coming up with something new, and becoming hot again. And again, in order to do so, they need to cut production drastically, come up with something new, and light that spark up again. Tell me this, tell me this, tell me this. In my watch collection itself, do you think I should be trimming my watches down? I got about 13, 13. Should I be reducing it? Well, first of all, let me tell you this. I don't feel like there's a number out there for any collectors uh, in terms of the amount of watches they should own or they should have. Sky is the limit as far as I'm concerned. You only need to keep that in line with what you can afford and how much money you spend on watches based on your lifestyle and other expenses. Uh, so if you're someone that can afford to have 150 watches in your collection, by all means do it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I do tell my clients often that have huge collections, and by huge collections I mean watches that are over 100 pieces. Some clients have 400 pieces. So some clients I have that have a collection that would take them uh, two years just to put on every single watch every single day. Do I feel that that's too much? No. If this is what they want and that these watches do get wear time, by all means. But oftentimes clients will call me and say, listen, I think I need to reduce my collection. I have too many watches. And I'm not talking about guys that are out there with 100, 200, 300 pieces. I'm talking about guys kind of like you that have 10, 12, 15 watches. And I simply tell them, it's very simple. Create a spreadsheet with the watch next to it and put a percentage in the right column of how much wear time that watch gets. At the same token, take into consideration sentimental value. Take into consideration iconic pieces. For example, on your steel collection. So I've got the IWC Inji. I got the Explorer 2 40 mil Polar. Breguet Type 20, Speedy Man on the Moon. I've got the Tudor Black Bay Heritage with the in-house. I've got a Tudor Hydronaut. Yeah, I made a mistake. I know, I know, I know. Out of the six watches that are there, I would most likely hold on to the Tudor Black Bay because I think that's an iconic watch. I would definitely hold on to the Rolex because you can't go wrong with Rolex. It just doesn't go down in value over time. It's always worth the money you pay for it, sometimes even more. The Omega, I'm, su I'm super biased. I, I love all the history behind Omega. Man on the Moon watch to me is an, like, should be a part of anyone's collection. I don't care if you're buying 80, 50, $100,000 watches out there, you should still have a cheaper Omega in your collection because indeed it's an iconic piece. The Breguet Type 20, it was sort of Breguet's first take on uh, you know a sports model. Also an iconic piece, also something I would probably hold on to. What would I get rid of in the first box that you showed me? Uh, 
Not a big fan of that tutors, not because it's a bad watch, just don't like the way it looks. And the IWC Ingenieur is another one I would probably not hold on to simply because it's a dog. It's a shitter watch, as you like to call it. And uh, there have been so many closeouts on IWC, specifically the Ingenieur models. That's just something that I would probably let go if it doesn't get wear time. Let's move on to your next box. I've also got my pieces on leather straps. I got the Hoya, Hoya Calibre 11. I got my Zenith El Primero Chrono Meister 1969 42mm. And I got my Reverso, Jaguar Cultural Reverso Grand Date. Definitely would hold on to the Reverso. I did a whole episode on Reverso history, and that's probably, to me, top five iconic watches ever made. Uh, if you guys get a chance, watch that episode again, and you'll see why I'm a big fan of the Reverso. Uh, the Zenith El Primero, it's a iconic, it's a legendary movement. Why not hold on to that watch? That's a great watch to hold on to. And then the tag, honestly, in my opinion, that's the best looking tag techwear has ever made. Definitely an iconic piece. I love that watch. That entire box is definitely a keeper. And I've also got, I've got a few, I've got my Pam, i got a uh, Breitling Super Ocean, and i also got my Patek, Patek Philippe World Time. Now let's go back to your last, you saved the best for last, and that's your Patek Philippe World Time. I'm not sure which, if you have the older 5110 or the, or the newer one, uh, the bigger or the smaller, but uh, I've always liked the World Times from Patek. In fact, I like World Time watches to me, they're personally useful because I do travel a lot. And hopefully next time my travels will take me to Australia, I can come visit you in person. But uh, uh, Patek Philippe is a Patek Philippe, and their ad stands true. You don't own a Patek Philippe, you may to hold on to it for the next generation, so to speak. I don't know if you have children or not, but that's certainly a watch I would hold on to and pass on to my children, should I keep it long enough. But to answer your original question, there's no such thing as too many watches in your collection. It's a matter of just looking at your collection over time, seeing where the value is, seeing certain watches tanking, maybe it's time to get out. Because look, at the end of the day, that collection adds up to a significant amount of money. If there are certain pieces out there that are tanking and you don't see a potential of them going up in value and at the same time you're not, they're not getting a whole lot of wear time, they're just kind of sitting in your box, then by all means get rid of them. But never set limits to your collection, only set limits based on what you can afford and just don't overbuy like anything else. Hey, I wanted to ask you, what are your favorite wristwatch channels? And where does Archie Luxury Play in that mix. That's a great question. Guess what? You are the only watch channel I am subscribed to at the moment. Uh, the reason for that, because I've looked at a few of the other watch channels that are out there, uh, and they all do the same thing. They're all, all the reason why I got out on YouTube to do my own shows, to do my own channels, because I wanted to do something different. Majority of the watch channels are out there do the white glove reviews of the watch. They talk about the nuts and bolts of watches and so on and so forth, which is great and don't knock it. But that information is so available online, you can go to a million different places to figure out the inner workings of any given watch. So I felt like I need to do something different. I need to talk about resale value. I need to be brutal and honest about certain watches. I need to try not to push stuff uh, because a lot of the watch channels, they do tie to companies such as mine and they you know, do most of the stuff for the purpose of pushing their product and getting visibility for their company. And by all means, it happens with me as well. I do get visibility for my own company with that. Watches do get sold because of some of the videos that I made on YouTube channels, but my whole purpose was to tell things the way they are, which is why you're the only channel at the moment that I'm subscribed to. If you have any other suggestions on other channels that you think I should subscribe to, YouTube is a huge space. I'm sure I haven't maybe found those channels that I would be fond of, but I don't have a favorite watch channel because the only watch channel I am subscribed to at the moment is my own company's channel, which is really all product videos, and yours. What do you think the best entry-level luxury wristwatch is? I myself am a huge fan of the Tudor Black Bay. I love the Tudor Black Bay with the in-house movement. You could have the ETA movement as well. I think this is the entry-level decent watch. What is your opinion? Best entry level luxury watch. Well, I told you my first watch was a Rolex, a Rolex Datejust, and I still feel that that is still the best watch to buy. I do like the Tudor Black Bay. It's a great watch. But unfortunately, Tudor still has that cloud hanging over its head, and the cloud says that other Rolex. And even though it looks like a Rolex, it feels like a Rolex. The movements are mostly the same in all of them, but guess what, it's still not a Rolex. So to me, if you're gonna go luxury, first luxury watch, you go with Rolex, Omega, or Breitling, with Rolex being number one, Omega number two, and Breitling being number three. 
it's affordable, it's recognizable. Most people that buy their first luxury watch, they want people to see that they have another luxury watch. And nothing is going to do it better than a Rolex. So Rolex, they just pre-owned around that $2,000 mark, you can get out there and find a slew of Datejust out there, some older ones that will set you back a little bit of money but have a huge effect in saying, bam, I have on a fancy watch. How much coin do you need to spend to get a decent wristwatch? Tell me, tell me, tell me! That's always been a tough question for me to answer because it really all depends on, on how much you can afford. You know, if you're out there and you're getting into watches, this is your first rodeo and you don't know which way to go, first set yourself a budget. And I could only really answer that question based on particular budgets. But if we're talking about under $5,000, which uh, pretty much any hardworking average Joe could afford, again, I'm going to go with Rolex. I'm going to go with Rolex Datejust. I'm going to go with Rolex Datejust 2. I'm going to go with a pre-owned Rolex that will more or less hold its value. Because the minute you buy your first watch, you catch a bug, and everybody knows that. So later on, you're going to take that watch and trade it in for something else. I would hate to see someone go out there and buy themselves a brand new IWC or Jaeger or one of those things that won't hold their value as well based on today's market. And then later on, find out that they spent five grand, but they're only getting $2,000 back in trading value. Now, you get out there, buy yourself a pre-owned pre Rolex under $5,000. Later on, you decide to upgrade or go up or, or, or just sell it flat out because you no longer want fancy watches. In the very least, you'll get most of your money back out of it, sometimes even more. Tell me what you think the optimum number of whist watches is in a collection. I guess I kind of already answered that question uh, when we talked about, you know, what's too many. Uh, the answer is very simple to this question, and that is, how many whist watches are you going to wear? Ultimately, you should have a dress watch, you should have a sports watch. That really is it. You can also have a few watches uh, with complications based on your lifestyle. If you travel a lot, a GMT watch is a must, or maybe even a world time watch if you can afford it. Uh, if you want conversation starters, if you want something that's rare, that you should have probably either a vintage piece in your collection or something that's extremely limited, hard to get, such as an extremely limited AP or an extremely limited Panerai for that matter. I personally don't own any watches, I've said this before on my channel, but there's certain watches that I decide to keep like this Hublot crystal that, uh, sapphire that I just bought, I absolutely fell in love with. I picked it up at a reasonable price, I'm going to wear it for a while, but even still, probably six months to a year, I'll probably end up getting rid of it. There is my Diamond Royal Oak that I always wear that's very sentimental. It's got a story behind it. I did an episode on that too. And that's something that I'm probably going to hold on to for quite a while. But I'm different. I have a bolt downstairs that have hundreds and hundreds of different watches that I can put on my wrist at any given time and wear it. For somebody who is a private, not a watch dealer, again, make sure you get wear time on all the watches that you own. Make sure you can afford to hold on to as many watches as you have. And that's really it. Use that. Complete this sentence. Archie Luxury is... Archie Luxury is eccentric. Hello, Archie Luxury here. Archie Luxury channel, f***ers. Hello, Nicholas. What I say there is, look, f***ers. Boring! Uh... I could also use words like exciting. Uh, I can also use words like different, but I think eccentric kind of encompasses you as an individual. Archie Luxury has been the greatest influence on your videos. Tell me if this is true or not. Actually, it's not. Because if you remember, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't know who Archie Luxury was up until one of my viewers asked me what I think about Archie Luxury. And as I told you guys before, I'm not influenced by anyone. That's not the purpose of this uh, YouTube channel, Archie. So the purpose of this YouTube channel is to be me, to tell like how it is, and not to be influenced by others that are out there. I simply turned the microphone on, turned the camera, and I started answering questions. I started talking about watches as they come across my desk. In fact, I don't even prepare for any of my videos. And literally, when there's a watch on my desk or three, four watches that come through, I pick them up. I put them on my tray, and I start talking about it. So my videos are not influenced by anyone with the exception of myself, my knowledge of the market, and perhaps some of the coworkers that are here in Luxury Brazil that say, hey, you should talk about this watch. This is a great watch to talk about. Put that on your next video. So no, I am not influenced by your video. I am, however, entertained by your videos, which I guess is a bit different. What is the most memorable Archie Luxury video you can remember? The most uh, memorable, well, obviously the shitter watch has got to be the number one memorable video. I mean, the way you uh, describe that and the amount of times you said the word shitter is, uh, is absolutely entertaining, amazing, and funny. Uh, but if I had to pick my favorite video, it would be the Archie Luxury video that was titled, and I'll link it below, 
an international YouTube guru for hire. When you went out there and said, look, I'm doing YouTube full time, guys. Uh, this is now how I'm going to make my living. You're not a watch dealer. This is what you do. You make your living on YouTube. And you flat out told guys, look, pay me $10, $20, $50, whatever it might be in order to support my YouTube channel. The way you said it, how you said it, I think it took a lot of courage. It took a lot of balls. and also took a lot of balls for you to get out there and do YouTube full time, which is great. You have enough of a following to do so. And I'm hoping that you do end up making lots and lots of money off this YouTube channel because I think you deserve it. So that is my favorite uh, YouTube video is when you actually went out there and told people that, hey, I'm doing YouTube full time and F you pay me. Fuck! Someone's ringing me! Well, guys, first and foremost, I want to thank Archie Luxury for doing this collab with me. I want to thank him for his question personally, taking the time to tape all this stuff and to do this little collab. I hope to do another one in the future with him. I think it's fun. I think it's something different. Give you guys something a little different to look at, a little taste of others out there uh, besides me on in uh, YouTube space. I'm hoping to find others that I can collab with. And uh, if you guys have any suggestions, by all means, like I said, I don't know a whole lot of watch YouTube channels. I'm sure you guys do. So feel free to make suggestions. As usual, comment below ask questions for the next episodes. Thank you guys for tuning in. Subscribe to Archie's channel. I'll put the link up at the end of this video. Uh, subscribe to my channel, hit the like button, hit the share button, and I'll see you guys next Tuesday.